Up against them, amen. The wave of glory. Tell your neighbor, say the wave is coming. The wave is coming. Amen. But I'm gonna say, God, feel the house. Amen. I'm gonna use that for the subtopic. God, feel the house. You may take your seat. Uh, the thing is, you gotta understand that everything that we gotta understand about God, that God, amen. Amen. Is a person that God is one who always feels something. The Bible says that after they built the temple, that God filled the place. Amen. Even the prophet had to say, He said, Who is this Lord? He is high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. You've got to understand that God has to dwell somewhere. And in order for God to dwell on the earth, He needs some reciprocals that He can go and put Himself in in order for Him to dwell. In other words, God needs some tabernacles of flesh that is on the earth that he can pour himself in. So wherever that tabernacle go, amen, the glory goes with it. So you've got to understand the first tabernacle that they had was a tent. And the tent that they had to put up everywhere they went because the tabernacle was mobile because they were not staying in one place. So God tabernacled himself in the tent. And when they set up the tabernacle, his glory will come in like a cloud and they will see the fire over the mercy seat. And it will come down, which represented that his presence had hit the place. But when they got ready to move, they would uptake the, the tabernacle and they would move it to the next location. But when the Amen Solomon had built the temple here, Amen, we see in 2 Chronicles, the temple became stationary. And the only way to get to the place of God, you had to go where the temple was to feel his presence. So it became stationary. It became in one place. It was only one place where it dwelled. God said, that's not good enough. When Jesus hit the scene and Jesus said, you know what, the works that I do, you should do greater works. Now you say, how can you do greater works than what Jesus did? When he was saying that you can reach more people than I reach. I didn't have internet. I didn't have television. He didn't have cell phones. So wherever he was, that's all he can, that's only people he can affect. But now we can be in one place and affect the whole world in one spot. So now he says, look, Jesus said, look, we gotta do a little bit better than this. So when Jesus came on the scene, amen, he ripped the, vine, the, the veil and twine and now he opened it up. He says, I, he said, I got to go. If I don't come, I can't stay. I mean, if I don't go, the Holy Spirit can't come back. He said, you got to let me go. I can't stay with you forever because what I'm getting ready to do is drop my spirit in the tabernacle. So God said, I need more soldiers. I need my presence to go over the world. So he took the same the, the, the temple that was stationary and now he made it mobile by putting it in each and every one of us that is in this house. So God said, take the tabernacle. We go Fill the tabernacle with his glory. And that's why you've got to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Because you've got to take the glory everywhere he wants you to take it. You've got to take it to the crack house. You've got to take it to the street. you got to take it in your neighborhood. you got to take it everywhere you go. you got to take it on your job. you got to take it to the family reunion. you got to take the glory with you. And so what God wants you to do, he wants the glory to fill you. So you can take the glory with you and tell your neighbor, say the glory. Oh. I gotta put some things here. What you've got to understand is that God wants to fill the tabernacle. So he says, now the tabernacle is you. Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And that means that the Holy Ghost needs a place to dwell. And that means that you've got to prepare your tabernacle in order to receive the glory of God. You've got to receive, you've got to get your tabernacle together so that the Holy Ghost can dwell in you. Now let me help you out. i got to do some groundwork here. And I see God is switching some things, but I gotta see God is trying to get us to see something. When you look over in the book, when Jesus had risen and ascended after his death, he appeared to his disciples, and he began to tell us that go back to Jerusalem and wait till you get endowed with some power from on high. And the Bible says, he said, he breathed on them and he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And he breathed on them and they received the Holy Ghost. But if you go to Acts chapter 1, you find out he goes again to them and he says, look, I need you to stay in Jerusalem and wait till you receive the promise of the Holy Ghost. He that they receive the promise of the Holy Ghost. It seemed like if the 12 disciples, the 11 disciples that he just breathed on received the Holy Ghost, why did they need to go back to Jerusalem and wait and get received and receive the Holy Ghost? Because you've got to understand before Jesus, amen, ascended, amen, the New Testament church had not yet been, had not been birthed yet. What do you mean? The New Testament don't begin in Mark, Matthew, Luke, and Mark, John. The New Testament begins after the 
resurrection. You got to understand that he was still under the Old Testament. He said, I came to fulfill, amen, the law. And so what he had to do, he fulfilled the law. So there was no born again believers yet. So when he preached over them, they received regeneration. They got, they got saved because nobody had been saved under the new covenant yet. So now they got saved. And so now they have to get some power to be a witness to what they got saved to. You've got to understand, you can be saved and still don't have the power yet. You can be saved and still don't have the power. You can be saved and amen, you're saved on your way to heaven, but you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost because you're going to need some power to wrestle with these devils. You're going to need some power to wrestle with your flesh. You're going to need some power to wrestle with your neighborhood. You're going to need some power to wrestle with your family. You're going to need some power. And we stop him when he 
wants to move because we got a program to perform. But you got to get past your program and let the anointing of God hit the place. When the anointing of God hit the place, he'll set free some folks. He'll deliver some people. He'll heal some people. He'll make a way out of no way. If you just let him come in and do what he wants to do to somebody, bless him in this house. trumpeters and the singers was as one to make one sound to be heard in praise and in thanksgiving. See the thing is is that when we all come in the house of God, we all got our own personal dilemmas. We got our own personal issues. We have got our own personal challenges. But when we come to the house of God, you need to take your issues and you need to take the things that you're facing and put it on the altar. The Bible says, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. And then when you go back to your seat, you get ready to praise. And you get ready to worship because we gotta hit one accord to make one sound in the house. You can't be saying, Lord, I need you to pray the life for him. And you can't be over there saying, Lord, I need you to heal my body. And you can't be over there saying, Lord, I need you to save my child. But when we get ready to come together, and we need to be saying, For glory, holy is the Lamb of God. We need to say, Thank you, Jesus. We need to be saying, Hallelujah. That we get one extinct sound. That the only thing that the Father heals is a worship. All that the Father here is his name being glorified. All that the Father here is the glory of his name being lifted up. And then he will come into the place. And he will begin to heal the child. And he'll begin to heal your body. And he'll begin to answer your prayer. When you just learn how to get the king of glory into the house. If you can get the power of God to show up in your tabernacle. If you can get the power of God to come on in. God will change the thing. Save! 
says, when the power of God hit the tabernacle, God said, I'm I accept what you be. And tell God accept your ministry. And tell God accept what you put before him. You can't move. But when he came down with the fire and the cloud hit the place, he said, I approve of what you did. Then Solomon gets to pray. The Bible said it was in a seven day feast. That means that he was praying for some time. Seven days the feast was going. Seven days he was praying. First chapter number six. He begins to lay out his prayer what he wants God to do. He said, God since you don't showed up. But I want everyone that looks this way. That even their father, even if they see it, if they repent, Father, that you would heal them. He would begin to say, God, I want you to deliver them. If they can't make it to the house, just let them look to the house. And he began to give all the Bible says of chapter number seven. When he made an end of his prayer. Chapter number seven says, now when Solomon had made an end of prayer, the fire came down. First, just the cloud came down in chapter five. But in chapter seven, the fire came down. And it burnt up all the sacrifice. Can you, what you don't want to let me help you, let me help you. What you don't understand, can you understand how bloody the altar was? That if they trade so many sheep and oxen they could not number, it was blood everywhere. <laughs> Sacrifice hurts. Sacrifice don't cost you something. Sacrifice, even it's gonna be it's gonna be bloody sometime. It's gonna be hurtful sometime. Sometimes you'll scratch your head and say, God, I don't understand why you're taking me through this. But God said, because what I'm trying to get you to, even it's gonna take some sacrifice. Look what he goes on to say. He said, and then it says, the sacrifice in the glory of the Lord filled the house. And then God shows up again. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord. See, they was they were standing in place the first time. And they seen the glory. And the glory came in and it interrupted what they was doing. They couldn't minister no more. We need some technical nervous. I need some interruptions. I need God to interrupt some services. I need the God to put some things on pause. I need the God to come in and say, no, I got this one. Pastor, take some rest. Just let me flow right now. Pastor, sit down, watch me move. Watch me heal. You know that person you've been praying for and laboring for some other things that's only changed their heart. He said, you watch me. I'm going to do it in a minute. You going to sit down and get your popcorn. Sit down and watch me perform. See what God wants to do. Some things we can't do. You got to let the Holy Ghost do it. And the glory of the Lord had filled the house, and they bowed themselves to the face of the ground. Now, what happens? This the priest couldn't move the first time, but now the power was so strong that everybody in Israel who stood at their house in the doors of their tents, seeing the glory hit the temple, it fell on their face. It's a sad commentary that we have not learned how to worship God. God start falling into place and we're looking at folks and talking. Even you ought to be getting in the present, getting on your face, recognizing the glory that hit, recognizing the presence that came, recognize that God just showed up in the building, recognize that God is here. Upon the people, don't tell me about that even way you worship. This is God. Don't do, you can't you can't go to, you can't go to England and the Queen of England come out there and you don't bow down. Well, I, my family don't bow. We going you see, don't bow and see what happens. The King of Glory come in and we won't even bow to him. And then we wonder why he can't show up and move. Cause you won't bow when he comes. You too busy looking at for what they do. They get into the presence. You better jump in. They said, they said they faced to the ground upon the pavement and they got on the dirt. Huh? 
And then it says, and worship and praise the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his mercy endure forever. And then the king of all the people offered up a sacrifice before the Lord. Wait a minute, they offered up another sacrifice. The first one to get his presence there to accept what they build, now they've given another sacrifice because they needed an answer. You've got to understand what place, what part you are in. What posture are you in? Because you've got to understand what you're trying to get from God. You first got to get him to you before you can speak to you. Oh and the king Solomon offered up a sacrifice of 22,000 ox and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people dedicated the house. Now they dedicate the house. They didn't dedicate the first time they didn't give him a call. See, the thing is, you think you got it all together. You ain't got there yet. You won't You're on your way, though. You're on your way. And then, then he says, after that, they made another sign. I gave a big offer. Good. But that just got you in the door. But now to release what I need God to release, I got to do something a little bit more. And then the Bible says, then God, after all of that, all that long prayer, read, read, read them three chapters together. After that long prayer, chapter six, now God begins to respond to the prayer of, of, of his servant Solomon. It took him to give an offering that he couldn't even number. Then it took him another 120,000 sheep, another 22,000 oxen. And then God says, I'm ready to talk. See, we want God to talk, we want God to bless, we want God to move, but we ain't giving him nothing. We won't even give him a decent hallelujah, a decent glory. Won't even give him a different decent wave. Won't even give him a give him a heartfelt thank you. Because God, you didn't give me that car I wanted, so I can't thank you. Oh God, I gotta move. And then God begins to, to do something profound. He begins to speak. And he says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, not my hand, not what you can give me. Lord, I need you to bless. I need you to be a bellhopper. God, I need you to touch this and do this and work that. No, he said, who will seek my face? Because the face of God represents his presence. Don't go after what he got. Go after him. And when you get him, you get what he got. He said, who will seek my face? Who will seek my face? And then turn from their wicked way. He said, my people can mess up if they will turn from their ways. So you've got to understand that God needs you to turn from you. The problem is, is that the tabernacle has these another infilling of the presence of God. See, what we got to understand, I got to get you there. What you got to understand, yeah, you've been baptized with the Holy Ghost. Yes, you've been saved, but you have not been filled or touched in the last three years. And the devil been whooping on your head and life been kicking, been drop kicking you. He been knocking all the breath out of you. And you tomorrow, I'm burned out in church. Now because you didn't get another feeling or another impartation, you need to get back to God and say, God, I need you to fill me all over again. I need another impartation. I need an impartation to go through this ailment that I'm going through. I need an impartation to deal with the folks on my job. I need an impartation to deal with that man you gave me, to deal with that woman you gave me. I need an impartation to deal with my children that lost their mind. I need an impartation to birth this man. So I can believe you when I can't see my way out. I need another impartation to stand on your word because I can't see how it's going to work. I don't know how we're going to pay the rent. I don't know how we're going to go forward. I don't know how we're going to build. But God, if you will fill me with another impartation of the Holy Ghost, it will give me the boldness to stand and to declare and decree the thing that I need in my life. I need God to give me another feeling. Fill my He says, call by my name, will humble themselves. Oh, you gotta pray. Not just when you get in trouble. You got to pray. Man shall always pray. Yes, she's not. 
You got to develop a life of prayer. Oh, and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. Then, then, then. See, we want God to talk to us and we ain't turned from nothing. We want God to talk to us and we ain't prayed yet. We want God to talk to us and we haven't given it a sacrifice yet. See, he'll give you a part. Uh, he'll give you something, but he won't give you what he really want to give you. You ain't make the requirements yet. Let me help you. Then it goes on, and then I will. Then, then it says, "Then will I hear from heaven?" Uh oh, turn for the book of ways. Then I will hear from heaven. In other words, God says, "I'll hear you when you're on earth praying to heaven." Come on. Come on. I will listen from my throne. When you pray, he, you get connected. When you pray, he responds. He said, I'm not going to be deaf here. I'm going to hear what you got to say. Because you know he says, then I will hear. That wasn't good to be solid. Had to be gone. Because God is answering his prayer. Oh God. And forgive their sins. Because he thought, I'm going to hear you and then I'm going to forgive sin. And I will heal the land. Then look when he goes in verse 15. And my eyes shall be open. My ears attentive to the praise. That is made in this place. You made the sacrifice. We don't even talk about the cost. Because we couldn't build it. We, every, every church on the earth couldn't build that temple now. It's too expensive. Amen. But he says, after you have made all that sacrifice and spent all that money and got all the things that I desire, and you gave that great sacrifice that cost much, and then you gave another sacrifice that cost much, he said, then God responded, he said, but I need you to do one more thing. I need you to pray, seek my face, turn from your wicked ways, and then I will hear from heaven. He says, I will answer you, and I will heal your land, and then my eyes will be upon you, and my ears attended to your prayer in this place. So when you show up here, I'll be waiting for you. See, you gotta get your tabernacle so full with the Holy Ghost that when you go to respond and ask God, He says, I'm right here waiting. I've been waiting for your petition. I've been waiting for your cry. See, the thing is, that's what God wants us to get. Amen. When I look at this a little bit farther, the Bible goes on to tell me, and I'm bringing this thing in, that the Bible goes in to tell us that in the book of Acts, when the, when the day of Pentecost fully came, that the Bible said they was in one place. Amen. On one accord. And they begin to glorify God. And as they begin to pray, that the Spirit of God came in. And it filled them with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Now we're trying to make it easy for folks and tell folks that you ain't got to speak. You just know you got it. Now if you got it, the Holy Ghost, when you buy a pair of shoes, you don't ask for tongues. Tongues automatically comes in the shoes. When you get the Holy Ghost, you ain't got to ask for tongues. The tongues automatically shows up with the Holy Ghost. He'll speak for us and I'm here. I'm here. He'll begin to speak for himself. Ain't nobody got to announce his arrival. He'll announce his own arrival. He'll let you know that I done showed up in the temple. I done showed up in the tabernacle. And the Bible says that he began to be filled and begin to speak in tongues as the Spirit of God give utterance. And what I want you to see that I'm asking God to send a glory cloud in this place. That when the glory of God hit the place, that it will fill the tabernacle. That preachers we ain't got to work so hard. That we ain't got to work so hard to get people saved and delivered. Because the temple will begin to be filled with the glory. I'm asking God to send the glory in so thick that even that he will announce itself in the community. The community will begin to hear about those signs and the wonders that's going for me in your tabernacle. And they'll come ready to see. We're going to get those who are curious. Maybe they gonna come and they'll get filled. We're gonna get all the critics. They gonna come and they'll get filled. I'm asking God even to show up like never before. And what we need God to do is bring his glory back to the tabernacle. We need God to bring his glory back to the house. We need God to bring his glory in like never before. I don't want to talk church. I want to live in church. I don't want to just talk about his goodness. I want to see his goodness. I don't want to talk about his miracle. I want to live in the miracle. I want to see God do some things. I want to see some folks get filled. I want to 
see some folks get saved. I want to see some folks get healed. I want to see God show up and blow our mind. I'm asking God to shake the place in the Holy Ghost. Tell your neighbors and get a good shake. Whether we should obey God or you. Let me help you. We gotta take that scripture out of context. Maybe they tell you to come up and do a five minute inspiration. And you get up there and lie on the Holy Ghost. And say the Holy Ghost told me to give this word. Even I know I did no better obey God than man. And you jump up there and get out of the will of God. Miss God. You only have five minutes. The Holy Ghost is not out of order. And he's subject to the pot. Matter of fact, he sit down when his five minutes is up. It's you just talking. It's just you and your flesh. He ain't out of order. He done left you by yourself. When he told him not to preach in the name of Jesus, he said, you be the judge of it. Should we obey God or you? Because some of the things that we have seen, in other words, if your leader tells you something and you don't do it, then you out of order. Now some ghost was talking to you. And I don't think he was very holy. They told him not to speak in the name of Jesus. Now, if your pastor say you can't, if he tells you to do something wrong, then you say, I gotta obey God. But when it comes to the order of the house, and you gonna do your thing, you out of order. Talking about the Lord laid it on my heart. No, the Lord ain't laid that on your heart. That was you and your flesh. Oh, God, let me get back to my message. You gotta understand that when he said it, the Bible says that even on, the, on that day that they came back running to the church, they just told them, don't you preach no more in the name of Jesus. They threatened them and they came back and said, church, let me check it out. They told us that we can't preach no more in the name of Jesus. But I want you to see something. What you've got to understand is this, that when they got back, they didn't come back with a sad story. But they said, Lord, do you see what the heathens had told us? And how they want to reign up against you, your holy son Jesus. He says, but what I'm asking is that you bring forth more signs and wonders. And that you let us prophesy and stop and don't stop. Fill us up with boldness. And the Bible says that God in the Holy Ghost was all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to prophesy and they did not cease. They was already baptized, but they needed another impartation. The church has lost its fire because they ain't got another impartation. The, Lord, the church has lost its enthusiasm because they don't have the impartation. You need to get filled again. Tell them, say, I need to be filled again. You got to understand, you need another touch. You need another impartation. You need another infilling because you don't have enough to last for the ministry that God called you to. Tell your neighbors, get your second assignment. Get your next impartation. 